Hi, uh, my name is Mark Johnson. I am CEO and co-founder of Descartes Labs. I'm gonna open my water. And today, um, I'm here to talk to you about tracking climate change uh, from space. Um, so let's do that. So what I'm gonna do is first is talk a little bit about um, how the world is changing, largely about kind of data that's coming online. Um, talk a little bit about us and the software that we've built uh, to try to go analyze and deal with those enormous amounts of data. Um, and then I'm gonna go through four vignettes. Um, so obviously tracking chi climate change from space is a massive, massive topic um, and will take decades for us to truly understand it. Uh, but I can give you a few examples of things that we can do today um, and hopefully this will give you uh, some hope for the future. So let's start off with how the world is changing. Well, I told you I was gonna be hopeful, but the first thing I'm showing you unfortunately is um, the deadliest wildfire uh, in California history, uh, the Camp Fire from last year. Um, so it was a terrible fire, um, 85 people died, um, about 240 square miles uh, was destroyed. So this is people's houses, vineyards, uh, beautiful forests. Um, and what you're seeing here, really neat, is uh, kind of the first minutes of this fire. Um, and kind of looking from a satellite uh, to see where the heat and where the fire is moving. Um, this is another image of the fire. This is maybe a few hours after ignition, so it's still relatively small to what it ultimately became. became. Um, you can see the massive smoke plume. Um, so these are sort of two different ways of looking at the fire. One, the first one uh, was looking thermally, so um, in a in something that the, the human spectrum, the human eye can't see, uh, whereas this is what the human can't, can see. Um, and the point here is that um, even though these, uh, these wildfires are terrible, um, they're getting more frequent and probably will get more frequent with climate change, um, there's a lot of hope because there are a lot of sensors going online. There's a lot of satellites going online. Um, one of the inspirations for Descartes Labs was um, that we have this incredible historical record of satellites and get basic questions about the planet. Um, how many trees have we cut down in the Amazon? Uh, and show me a map of that year over year um, are, still, uh, are still elusive. So we're trying to solve that problem and trying to bring this data from the sky um, uh, to, uh, to something that can affect the planet. So let me show you uh, four examples of sensors that uh, we're gonna be featuring in the presentation. Um, so the first one is Landsat 8. Um, so this is a big satellite, uh, very important satellite. Um, the Landsat program is one of the gems of, uh, of NASA. Uh, the first Landsat went up in 1972. So Landsat 1 went up in 1972. Um, it, the idea was to have a continuous record of the Earth um, for many, many decades. And I think what's interesting about NASA putting it up in 1972 was the amount of data coming off of this satellite was just enormous, right? There wasn't enough storage on the entire planet to store all these images. Um, they used to be stored in film, uh, but the expectation was that at some point, uh, these images would become very, very useful. Um, so they kept putting up satellites. Uh, luckily, each of those satellites lasted even longer uh, than it had been expected to live. Um, so we've got this incredible image, or uh, set of images over the years. Um, that's like almost 60 years of data now uh, from Landsat. Uh, when we started the company, it was about a petabyte of data over um, that series of years. Uh, so one of the challenges of, of dealing with this is that the, earth ma the, the mass of the Earth is large, so 150 million square kilometers of land mass, um, and the size of the images is really big. Um, so you know, the, the challenge for us is how you create a system that goes and, and ingests all of that data. Um, the European Space Agency has not been sleeping either. Uh, they have a fantastic program called Sentinel that launched uh, a few years ago. Um, there's a series of different satellites in this, so one, two, three, five. Um, this is uh, Sentinel-1, and this is a super neat satellite because uh, Landsat basically takes pictures. So the same concept of when you take a photograph, the light is bouncing off of something, um, it's absorbed by the sensor, um, that's what a satellite does. So the sun hits the earth and is absorbed by the sensor. Um, in this case, it's actually an active sensor. So it shoots down a radar beam. Um, you've heard from companies like Capella Space and ISI uh, here. And it's really neat because it's sort of like seeing like a bat. Right? So it's hard to really describe exactly what this looks like, but uh, basically you're shooting down a radar beam um, and then that radar beam is picked up by the satellite. Uh, and there's some things you can see with this. So one thing you can see is displacement. So you can see the ground moving by uh, comparing images. Um, another thing that you see um, is changes. So the reason you can see changes is that uh, basically the amount of signal that goes back to the satellite is different um, as conditions change. So think about something like a parking lot. 
If you just have a big parking lot full of asphalt and you shoot down a radar beam and it gets absorbed, there's gonna be a lot of reflectance there, right? Because it's just a big flat lot. If suddenly there's a bunch of cars in that lot, um, you, you will notice that change because something is different. The amount of, of signal getting back to the satellites changed. Um, so what's neat about this is it gives scientists a whole new tool uh, to go understand the planet. Um, actually, another neat thing about it is the wavelengths are really long, uh, and that means that they penetrate clouds. Uh, so uh, in areas where it's very cloudy, over half the Earth it has clouds on at any given moment. So in areas where it's very cloudy, uh, the satellite's very useful. So think about something like a hurricane. Um, when a hurricane comes through, there's an enormous amount of damage. Um, how, do you go, how do you go see what the damage was from space if there's, uh, if there's a big rain cloud over, over Houston? Um, so a really useful satellite, a different modality, a different way of thinking um, about data. Okay, back to the US. Um, these are great satellites, uh, GOES-16 and 17. Um, so the way those first two satellites look, so Sentinel-1 um, and Landsat, um, they're push brooms. So they basically circle the globe like this, and the globe is turning, and they're constantly taking pictures of it. So those pictures are refresh, refreshed with Landsat, uh, with two satellites about um, every other week, um, and about every 10 days with uh, Sentinel-1. This is neat because it's a geostationary satellite. So it just sits in a single place and just keeps taking pictures of the same thing. Um, and it's not great resolution, so um, say two kilometers per pixel, but it does mean that you get a full picture of the continental United States every five minutes. So you've probably seen examples of this, like when you see, uh, when a hurricane's coming through the Gulf and you see the, the cloud twirling, um, that's usually from this satellite. So the idea here is that uh, it's just very, very high temporal frequency, which again gives us a sort of another dimension um, to look. And the last one that we'll feature is uh, Sentinel-5P. Um, this is really neat because it, uh, it's not radar, um, it's not optical, it's actually trying to understand um, greenhouse gases. So monitoring our atmosphere from space. Um, so the reason it's Sentinel-5P is it's precursor. Um, there's a lot of things that we don't quite know yet uh, about how to sense greenhouse gases from space. Um, this sensor, uh, newly gone online, only uh, about six months now, um, is really exciting because this is gonna give us a record of greenhouse gases and will inform future sensors uh, as we think about the next one in the series. Okay, so I, I think that the point here is that there's, this is four really interesting satellites, um, but there's many, many more up there. Um, so now I'm gonna take it back a little bit and talk a little bit about who we are um, and why we got into space in the first place. So as I noted, um, we are uh, in Santa Fe, New Mexico. My background is actually in machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, largely on the web. Um, so I worked for a bunch of uh, startup search engines, uh, basically everybody but Google. Uh, and then um, I ran a, a, a recommendation startup, so basically a news app that recommended articles that you wanted. So I'm, I'm off in San Francisco. While I'm off in San Francisco, there's a group at Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, working on deep learning artificial intelligence for large scientific data sets. Um, so I got a call from them in the summer of 2014, and I was fascinated. So I thought of Los Alamos as a nuclear weapons lab, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's the birthplace of the nuclear bomb, after all. Uh, it turns out that there's lots of blue sky research that happens at Los Alamos uh, beyond uh, nuclear weapons. So for example, there's a large supercomputing group there. Uh, because after we had a test ban treaty, thankfully, um, we had to simulate what would happen with nuclear weapons rather than actually test them uh, in the real world. So a lot of simulation work, a lot of artificial intelligence work, a lot of supercomputing work um, is done at Los Alamos. So this group was applying uh, deep learning uh, to, uh, to scientific data sets. So really neat stuff like trying to find supernova in uh, astronomical data or trying to predict crop yields from the sky. Um, but what the scientists realized is their biggest problem was data. So once they had the data, they started to have algorithms that, that they could be reusable um, and they can make sense of this data. But just getting the data and processing the data was very difficult. Like this is, goes beyond data sets where you can just process on your laptop. Um, you're talking terabytes or potentially petabytes of data. Um, and that's why we spun out of labs because we wanted to solve that problem. We wanted to build a laboratory for scientists that had tons of Earth data um, so we could build the digital twin of the planet. 
So this is a really, really ambitious goal. Um, but we really need to do this if we want to be good stewards of our natural resources. Uh, so humans are like, we're like little ants, um, and we grow stuff in the ground, we pump stuff out of the ground, we, we mine metals, we move it around, we process it, and then we build things. Um, and the goal of Descartes Labs is to try to understand all those processes, uh, both natural and man-made, so we have a better understanding of how we're affecting the planet and, and how the planet works. So, um, these curves got all funny in the formatting, but they should be bell curves. Um, <laughs> so, but I think it's appropriate because one of my points is that um, the curve of technology is nonlinear. Um, so I lived through three major eras, uh, PC, internet, mobile. Um, and one of the hallmarks of these eras at the beginning, it's really hard to see the end state. Um, so I think of, there's this great ad from the 60s from Honeywell um, that was like, had this massive like dishwasher size machine in the, in the kitchen and it's like printing out recipes. Like obviously now you've got Alexa and you can say, Alexa, how many, you know, how many teaspoons are in a tablespoon? Far better than the, the big thing that just prints out recipes. Um, with the internet and mobile, like if you had told me in 1995 when I saw my first web page that I would be buying tons of stuff uh, every day off of Amazon and would be shipped to my house, that sounds crazy. Um, so it's really hard to see the, the end of these eras. Um, and I think we're all here because we see this next era coming. Um, it doesn't really have a good name yet, so call it AI plus big data. Basically, there's a ton of data going online. Um, there's a ton of work uh, uh, going on in artificial intelligence. Um, and what we wanted to do at Descartes Labs is focus on data about the Earth and figure out what piece of software we needed to build in order to enable scientists to go understand that data, to go make some intelligence on top of that data. And what we decided is that uh, it's a piece of software called the data, let's call it a data refinery. Um, so the idea is to understand changes in the world, all the sensor data represents changes in the world, um, and make predictions about the future. Um, and I think we can boil it down to just a few parts. So of course data is really important, so ingesting that data, cleaning that data, um, having lightning fast access to that data, um, the modeling tools that you need to go build intelligence on top of that data. Um, and this is both, both of these are supported by scalable compute. Think of it like a supercomputer in the cloud. On the data side, sometimes you need to ingest enormous data sets. So um, Descartes Labs has about 16 petabytes of data in the archive. Um, we pull in somewhere between 10 and 15 terabytes of data every day. Um, we've shown that we could pull in up to a petabyte of data a day. These are really, 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 really big data sets. Um, so you want to be able to scale that data side uh, effectively infinitely. Then on the modeling side, again, the Earth is big, 150 million square kilometers, so oftentimes what you want to do is take a model and run it in a small area and then scale it up to the world. One of the traditional problems that we have in the geospatial world is that a lot of this stuff used to be done on your computer. You would download a single Landsat scene, um, which is big but still really small with respect to the entire planet, um, and you would go build a model there. And then what if you wanted to run that somewhere else? You have to download another scene and run the model on that scene. Um, we regularly do things that require tens of thousands of cores, um, and things like, what if you wanted to find every windmill on the planet? What if you wanted to find every solar panel on the planet? And then watch those changes through time. So the scaling on the compute side, or the modeling side is, is just as important as on the data side. So, Unlike these previous revolutions where we didn't have any analogs, luckily there's these digital first companies that have already built data refineries. And if, if you believe my thesis on data refinery, you can recast each of these companies in light of a data refinery. So data refineries look at, look at data and make predictions about the future. So Amazon looks at uh, your purchase history and predicts what you want to buy. Facebook looks at the social graph and predicts what you want to read. Um, Google predicts what your search results should be. Um, Netflix predicts um, what you want to watch. What's neat about each of these companies is that one of the hallmarks of a data refinery is that it gets better the more data it gets. So that means that if you know, Google is in a, in a really enviable position because they created a better search en engine than everyone, they started generating user data because they had a better search engine because people wanted to use it, and then they figured out how to take that data and make the search engine better. So this is a flywheel that begins. Another interesting thing is that new businesses come about. So Netflix at some point realized that they know so much about what you like uh, that why should they recommend other people's content when they have a better view into what you like than, uh, than the people producing the content. So a whole new business came from this. So again, so if you look at Descartes Labs, we had a thesis about building a digital twin of the planet. And the question is what industry um, will be affected most by the fact that we have pictures being taken from the sky. 
So it's not the most sexy industry in the world, um, but it's commodities. Um, so this represents kind of uh, moving from field to table, uh, so agriculture. But think about uh, commodities as the food we eat, um, the, the metal that we mine out of the ground, um, the oil that we pump out of the ground. Um, and these companies are, are old, right? They're not digital first companies like the previous page. These are often over 100 years old. Uh, we've been doing this for a while. And one of the advantages that these companies have from an information perspective is they typically have large geographically distributed supply chains. And that means that wherever they have assets, they know something about there. So um, if I have a bunch of grain elevators in Iowa, I can call up the grain elevator managers and say, how's the corn doing in Iowa? Um, that, that equation is going to change for these companies as that information becomes known to the general market. One of the things we uh, did in the early days of Descartes Labs was we built a corn production forecast for the United States. Um, so we tried to forecast during the growing season um, how much corn was going to be output in billions of bushels from the United States. So we built a really accurate model, and we moved the price of corn 3% that day. So like, this woke up the agricultural world to the fact that suddenly what they used to think was their proprietary data was soon going to be generally available. Um, and what we want to do as Descartes Labs is try to bring this capability, bring this prediction capability um, to uh, these older school companies. Now, I'm going to get back to climate change because there's another effect to the fact that we've got all these sensors um, in space and otherwise looking at these companies. Um, so as you can imagine, um, commodities are industries that uh, um, have a large number of externalities. There's a lot of stuff that they produce that's not their stuff, and that's in the form of greenhouse gases and pollution and whatnot. Um, and these companies have largely escaped the effect of those externalities because it's so hard to measure them. Um, with, uh, with, when you have spy satellites taking pictures of the entire supply chain, suddenly these things are going to light up. Um, and I think it's going to cause these companies to act in a much more responsible, much more sustainable way. I think smart companies are going to realize that right now um, and take this effort into their own hands and really understand uh, the effect that they're having on the planet, measure it themselves, uh, and, and try to be more responsible citizens and better stewards of the environment. Um, so that's Descartes Labs um, and what we're trying to build. This is our team. Or really, it's actually our team from like six months ago. So there's like 30 or 40 more people now. Um, we're about 100 people at Descartes Labs. Uh, again, headquartered in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm repping today with my Southwest flair with my uh, cowboy boots and my belt buckle. Um, we've taken $38 million in funding. Um, we're a little over uh, four years old. Um, and now I'm going to tell you what our scientists are doing. OK. Uh, so first scientist we want to feature is Laura Mazzaro. Um, so she's an atmospheric scientist. Uh, she came from Los Alamos National Laboratory. Um, and what we're going to show you here is that, that satellite, Sentinel-5P, some of the really cool things you could do with it. So now we're going to get into some really cool imagery. Um, so this is a picture of the globe, um, slowly spinning. Um, and this is a map of, of NO2, so nasty smelling gaseous pollutant, mostly from burning things. So obviously not very good for you. Um, but Sentinel-5P doesn't just track this. It tracks aerosols, carbon monoxide, formaldehyde, uh, carbon dioxide. So it's a really rich satellite. I think there's a few really neat things here. Um, let's see, if you see from India there, there's a line that goes over. That's a shipping lane up, uh, up into China. Um, you can sort of see where ships in the oceans go and where, um, uh, where there are planes over the Pacific. Obviously, you can see cities light up. Um, so you can see a lot from this. So uh, a night, NO2 sort of is not the most dangerous um, uh, greenhouse gas, but certainly something that we want to track. Another view of it is here, uh, a little more static. Um, and again, cities, of course, are places where a lot of things are burned, a lot of pollution. Um, and here, you can really see very clearly that line. Um, so look from, uh, look from Spain all the, th all the way through the Mediterranean, um, down through the Suez Canal, um, and you can see those shipping lanes really pop out. Another neat thing here is if you look at the bottom of the map, um, that's Africa, and you might say, well, what, well what's going on there? Uh, it turns out those are bushfires. Uh, so basically, there's not a lot of population there, but there's a lot of naturally occurring fires, um, and that's why we see a lot of, um, uh, a lot of NO2 there. Another thing that Sentinel-5 tracks is aerosols. Um, so you can imagine sources like this are, um, you can see all that over the Sahara, so obviously um, dust storms and whatnot. Um, you can see things like sea salt. 
Um, so if you look over um, in the middle of Africa there, that's, uh, that's uh, salt coming off of the sea. Uh, combustion adds to aerosols. Uh, and of course, uh, these decrease visibility. It's not good for your health. Um, contributes to acid rain. So there's all sorts of reasons why we want to track aerosols uh, in the atmosphere. I think another, another thing just to note about these images is these are global composites that we're building really for the first time. So the satellite is so new, it's really exciting to see these images. I mean, think about that. There's atmospheric scientists who've been working sort of with, with sample data for a long time. And now we have this continuous monitoring of the globe, which is just very, very exciting. So, ooh, sorry. Uh, one of the most dangerous greenhouse gases is methane. Uh, and methane has a really interesting history because it's actually more dangerous than we used to think it was. Uh, so back in 1980, I think the first uh, study was published, and it seemed like uh, a ton of methane in the atmosphere was about 20 times worse than a ton of carbon dioxide. Uh, that number has actually been revised up several times since then. And the latest estimate, and remember, this is all just estimates, but it's not good, uh, is 35 times worse. Um, so that's, that's not good. Now, the good news is that carbon dioxide uh, lasts much longer than methane. So methane is on the order of 50 years. Carbon dioxide is 100 years. Um, but we don't really understand methane nearly as well as carbon dioxide, not just from the effects, but also uh, we don't really understand the sources and sinks. We understand the carbon dioxide cycle. We understand that plants breathe uh, carbon dioxide. It's trapped in soil. Uh, with methane, there's a lot of things we don't know. So this, this satellite is going to be really critical to give scientists the tools for um, understanding where methane's come from. Now, of course, we know some of the sources. Um, so this is a really neat map. This is a different satellite, actually. Uh, this is nighttime lights. Um, and what's neat here is that, obviously, cities like Dallas, Houston, Austin um, light up at night. But the yellow here, so the Permian Basin is one of the most productive oil fields in the world, um, about 20% in New Mexico, most of it in Texas. Um, and you can see those, those orange lights. Those aren't cities. Uh, that's what they call flaring. So uh, part of the process of fracking, um, not only do you, uh, do you loosen the oil in the ground, but you also let out typically a ton of gas. Um, now, you could capture that gas and sell it as natural gas. Oftentimes, it's just too expensive. Uh, there's no pipeline there. There's no method of distribution. Um, so, so it just sort of goes to waste. Um, and there's two things you could do with it. One is just vent it, so just let it go. The other is burn it. And this is one of those cases where it might not be obvious what the right answer is. So once you know that carbon dioxide is not nearly as bad as methane, uh, even though it seems counterintuitive, you actually want to burn, uh, burn this. If you're not going to actually capture it for, um, for usage, um, it's better to burn it. So there's also kind of neat things um, that you can see from space. Uh, so, of course, this is a, a global composite of methane. Um, and the Permian Basin in Texas uh, shows up pretty clearly. But look at the Sahara in the Middle East. Wow, there's not a lot of people there. Um, there's obviously not a, uh, there's oil fields in Saudi Arabia, but not sort of in the middle of the Sahara. So what's going on there? Well, one of the problems is we don't really know. Um, we have some theories about it, and the best theory about it is that um, not all methane is created equal. Like, obviously it's all chemically the same. Uh, but its effect, depending on the atmospheric conditions, likely is different. So for whatever reason, the weather conditions in Sahara are perfect for causing the methane to absorb more energy than it would otherwise. Um, so this is, this is one of those things where there's just a big open question here. Um, and the goal, if we really want to understand how these systems interact, is to gather more data um, and then think about what other sensors um, we can put up to go measure um, and monitor. So there are things we could do today. Like, obviously, there's a lot of pretty pictures there um, and a lot of good uh, data going into science, but there's really things that we could do today. So um, uh, you'll, you'll see this is actually China. Um, and what we're trying to do here is to understand the point sources of pollution. Um, so could we look at every factory on the planet, every place on the planet where we see pollution, and understand why and where it's coming from, um, start, to tracking, start to track what, uh, what we're doing? Um, so we know where the biggest sources of pollution are. Um, and I think this is pretty exciting because uh, I'm going to talk about trees in the next three vignettes. Uh, but remember that all of this stuff is related. 
uh, right? The carbon dioxide cycle is deeply related to uh, forests. So um, one of the goals in building this digital twin of the planet is building up some of these libraries, some of these uh, data sets, some of these analyses, and then combining them so we have a much richer picture about how all of these things interact. Okay, oh, there's no picture. Well, that's too bad. Um, oh, I swear this really is Alice. It's a really cool picture of her is judo. I think she's doing judo, so I'm sorry you don't get that. Um, but interestingly, so she's a data scientist. She's actually a computational chemist uh, and worked at a drug company before this. Uh, and I think this is an important point about data science and building a data laboratory, is you want to make sure that scientists who come from different backgrounds are able to use that underlying data. So in this case, as long as you're a data scientist, we try to set up the system so that um, as long as you understand that everything is, a, is a, a vector of something on the globe, whether it's red, green, blue, whether it's temperature, precip precipitation, and wind speed, or something else, it really is just some, some data about that point on the globe. We want to allow as many scientists as possible um, not just access to this data, but the ability to go analyze it. And what she's been working on is forestry. Um, so this is where uh, synthetic aperture radar shines. Uh, because I told you earlier that uh, it's cloud penetrating. And it's sort of a, a different way of seeing. It's really good at looking at changes. So the fact that it's, it, it can see through clouds and the fact that it looks at changes makes it ideal for looking um, at uh, deforestation. Uh, this is actually not a forest, obviously. This is Manhattan and New York. Um, but a really neat thing here is that you see um, uh, the, the bright blue areas. Um, those are actually neighborhoods uh, that have north-south running streets, um, which means that there's really strong radar return because the buildings are, are oriented perpendicular um, to the radar beam. Um, so th again, this is sort of just the point is that this is such a weird and new data set um, that it allows us to see the world in this entirely new way and gives us a whole new way um, of understanding the, the planet. So the idea here was to start to build a deforestation detector globally. Uh, people have done this before. Typically, the maps come out on a yearly basis. That doesn't do you much good um, in real time. Um, and of course, we want to monitor where people are, are cutting down trees on a regular basis. So the challenge is, how do we make a, um, a, a, an algorithm that can go global and is really good at looking at trees in many, many different geographies? Um, so again, clouds, the bane of our existence here, especially in the tropics. Um, so this is uh, basically two years um, of a mangrove forest in Ecuador. Um, and you can see there's a lot of clouds. Um, there are some images that don't have many clouds in them, but a lot of these images are 100% obscured by clouds. So this is two years of data. Um, so you can imagine that deforestation could be happening here. We would have no idea if we just used, um, if we just used optical. But interestingly, it pops out uh, in synthetic aperture radar. Um, so on the, I guess your left, um, there's this Sentinel-2 image, so an optical image of where there's obviously some deforestation. Um, and of course here you can see it really clearly. It's a cloud-free image. We had to really search for that. Um, and on the right you can see how it just pops out um, in radar um, in, a, in a much different way. So I'm going to show you a number of images here before and after. But remember that the way that we detected where there was deforestation was with SAR. We've just used these two images for, for context. Um, actually, we just uh, uh, put something on our Instagram today at Descartes Labs um, that shows sort of that middle step that's missing here. But the way that we were able to draw those lines around uh, the deforested area uh, was because that there's this, uh, this algorithm on, on the radar data. So um, this is uh, in Indonesia. Um, so this is in Borneo, um, lowland rainforest, so again, very, very cloudy. Um, and the main driver of deforestation in Borneo is palm. So palm oil is a fast-growing industry, uh, so we've cut down a lot of rainforest in order to grow palm trees for, uh, for palm oil. So here's Laos. Um, so this is, again, a different type of tree, but uh, same, same algorithm. Um, the main deforester, uh, uh, a source of deforestation in Laos is rubber. Um, so this is sort of bamboos and pines. Um, this is interesting. This is in Wisconsin. Um, unlike uh, Laos and Borneo, we're actually gaining trees in Wisconsin. Um, and this, is, this is legal logging, so aspens, maples, pines. Um, but I think it's neat that this is a way that we can go track what we're doing. When, when we are being responsible, this is a way to go verify that we're being responsible uh, with this kind of change detection. 
And it's not just agriculture, it's not just uh, um, uh, pulp, uh, it's also other things like fish farms. Uh, so you can see these fish farms pop up. Uh, this is a bunch of mangrove trees, um, and you can see that they've, uh, they put fish farms in there. So one of the things you could do once you have this detector is to start thinking about why uh, places were deforested. Um, so there's this blue area in the middle there, which is uh, new fields. Um, and then the question is, why are they there? Um, and what we did was we combined this, uh, this uh, tree detector, or I guess lack of trees, the deforester detector, um, and combined it with this global data set uh, around agriculture. And you can guess that if uh, the, the places of deforestation were agriculture, then probably if there's something else where there are trees cut down nearby, it was probably because of agriculture. So this is another example of sort of combining data sets to try to be smarter uh, about what we're seeing. So it's not just understand the correlation, but also understand some of the causation. Another example, so this is what we're really trying to do is try to get higher time resolution. So not just see a once a year shot where you see a bunch of trees get cut down, uh, but you can see these different boxes um, represent sort of how this, was, uh, how this area was cut out over time. Um, so really trying to turn this into a global product right now. Um, so this is really good work that we've done in trying to make this so that uh, we have a continuously running uh, global deforester detector. Okay, um, so uh, the next thing we're gonna talk about is wildfires. Um, this is Clyde. Um, I think what's really neat about Clyde is that he actually started off his career in building the satellites. So originally on the hardware side of things, um, and then his next job was in processing the data coming down from the satellites, and now he's a scientist working on the data that's coming down. So uh, this is actually a real picture. Those are Cartesians running there. That's what we call people from Descartes, of course. Um, and when they were on this run, they see this, this plume of smoke in the background um, that turns out it was a forest fire, the Ute Park fire. Um, you certainly couldn't run on this mountain. This is uh, Wheeler Peak, the tallest point in New Mexico at 13,000 feet. Um, and you can see that forest fire started. It was pretty bad and the, the, smoke, uh, um, the smoke was terrible. Um, so how do we find forest fires? So obviously you can't have people running on the mountains um, and detecting forest fires. Um, but we actually, did, we're lucky that humans cover a lot of the globe, right? So um, we can figure out where forest fires from where people live. Um, although, of course, forest fires more often happen in places where there are forests, which is typically not where people live. Um, but we also have people traveling on roads, so, uh, or maybe running on mountains, so maybe see forest fires. Um, certainly pilots flying overhead, so planes crisscrossing the, the state. Um, there's, of course, uh, fire towers and whatnot that, that we create to, to look for areas where there might not be as much coverage. Um, and then, of course, during fire season, we might want to run reconnaissance missions. Um, this is actually really important to us in New Mexico. Um, so Santa Fe is at 7,000 feet. Uh, we're at the southern tip of the Rockies, so there's mountains right behind us, uh, right, against, uh, right next to huge, two huge national forests. Um, so something, being in a desert and being around a bunch of trees, obviously something very important to us. Um, so what we wanted to do, because you know, we see this uh, every year during the fire season, is try to build an early warning detector. So how do you, the, 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 one of the biggest challenges with, with fires is the sooner you know about it, the, the quicker you can take action. Um, so can you, uh, can we build an, a, a, de a fire detector from space um, that augments these other, uh, these other methodologies? Luckily, earlier I told you about these fantastic geostationary satellites, GOES, that just came online. So there's two, um, go 16 and 17, so they sort of take uh, two different disk pictures like this. Um, so every five minutes over the continental United States. So the question is, for the continental United States, could we use this five minute satellite um, to go look at, uh, at where fires might be popping up? Um, we actually get an image from GOES onto the Descartes Labs uh, platform um, ready for analysis within four minutes. So um, the time between when the image is taken and when the image is analyzed is, is, is pretty quick. So um, this is the GOES satellite. Again, this is the, um, uh, the uh, Campfire, yes, thank you. Um, so you can see on the left is the image of the smoke plume, but on the right is the infrared image. And what's really neat here is that you're actually seeing the flames, you're seeing the heat. 
Um, and what we don't want to use to detect uh, wildfires is just the plumes, right? Those can be confused with clouds. You know, they're, at some point they're very visible, uh, but usually when the fire is really bad. So the question is, can we use this heat signature um, and try to figure out where the fire has started so we can send the authorities there as quickly as possible? Um, so this is actually uh, uh, a, 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 another representation of all the data that we're getting from the campfire. Um, so there is 288 ghost observations every day um, because it takes pictures so frequently. You compare this with previous methodologies and um, you know, we would get a, a few vi uh, visits a day and obviously if that's hours after the fire started, it's no good. Um, so the fact that we get all this data very, very quickly um, is very promising because it means that we can try to detect things earlier. Um, so what, we're, what we do here is that we try to create a state of normal. Uh, so what does the world normally look like? Um, and what is hotter than that look like? So um, can we see uh, fire spreading? And can we see that, that heat signature from the fire? Um, and this means that these are pretty anomalous, right? It's a very hot source and, and not typical. Um, so if we can see this from the satellite, we might be able to detect them early. So we did this uh, for uh, part of, I guess we've annexed part of Texas. Uh, this is New Mexico and a little bit of Texas. Uh, and what you can do really neat with satellite data is you can go look in the past and compare what, uh, what you would have said um, and, uh, to what actually happened. And this gives you a sense of how you would have done. So the size of the circle here represents the size of the fire. And then the color represents whether we re detected the fire before it was reported or after. And really excitingly, um, not every fire we were able to catch, but we were able to catch some of them before they were actually reported to authorities. So this has really given us a lot of hope um, that uh, we can continually build, uh, we can continually build on this um, and try to build at some point a global fire detector um, to, uh, uh, to really understand global forest fires. You can imagine there's a lot of forest fires in places where there's nobody, like a forest fire can start in New Mexico, we're gonna learn about it within uh, a day. Uh, a fire can burn in Siberia for you know, a few days and no one would even know about it. So this idea of a global fire detector is absolutely critical. Okay, one last one. Um, Aiden uh, was actually an intern uh, from Caltech, so just a sophomore at Caltech. Um, and uh, his project, so and we talked about deforestation, which gets rid of trees. We talked about fires, which also get rid of trees. But this is nice because it's reforestation. So his question was, um, can we count every single tree um, in every city in the world? Um, and could he build a detector to do that? Um, so one of the challenges with trees is that they look like other things. So um, if you want to run a, a tree detector in the city, one of your confusers, for example, is just the ground. Right? So um, if you, uh, actually imagery is really good at understanding uh, vegetation. So photosynthesis has very particular characteristics um, with the light bouncing off the plants. Um, so you can use some, uh, uh, you can use infrared plus, um, plus the red bands to understand where things are growing. But if you just understood where things are growing, you're gonna pick up stuff that's not trees, right? You're gonna pick up parks and other sorts of greenery. Um, so the, the challenge is, how do you go build a model um, that picks up the trees, but not all the other living vegetation um, in a city? Um, so the way we did that um, is he used a combination of aerial photography um, and LIDAR. So LIDAR is really good at picking up trees, obviously, because it actually sees the tree. Um, and he was able to train a model that combined these data sets but then the, the model actually can be run on just aerial imagery. So you no longer need the LIDAR data. So we created this, and this is a really um, sort of neat way of thinking about machine learning where um, sometimes, especially when you're dealing with global scale, um, the data sets don't exist, the training sets don't exist. So you kind of have to generate them yourself. Um, in this case, there are certainly cities who are good stewards of their trees. Um, they have people that go off and count them. As you can imagine, these projects are very expensive. They take a long time. Uh, and it's not reasonable to do them continuously, and likely even the best project, you're gonna miss trees. Um, so sh sure, there are some cities with good ground truth, but most cities don't even know where all their trees are. Um, so this is a way of sort of synthetically creating that ground truth from a really high re reliability data set like LIDAR, um, and then using uh, much cheaper data sets like Arial um, to go find all the trees. Um, so what we did with this is then we, uh, for every major city in America, we ran a tree detector. 
And I think one of the neat things about this is how the cities actually pop out, right? So there's no trees growing in the roads. So this is almost like a, um, like a negative image of the city, right? Where you're seeing all the trees, uh, which means where they're not trees are other things like buildings and whatnot. Um, so this is Minneapolis, uh, New York City, and Miami, but of course can be run anywhere. Um, and this is really important for cities, right? So um, trees, obviously, not only are they beautiful and, and pleasant to be around, uh, but of course they have an effect on heat islands in the city. Um, they have effect on public health. Um, they absorb a lot of greenhouse gases. So being good stewards of our trees is uh, critically important. Um, here's a picture of Baltimore. Um, you notice sort of on the edges are sort of your leafy areas. Um, those are also affluent areas. Um, you notice the inner city, there are not nearly as many trees. Um, so obviously that's a correlation. I don't know if that's a causation, but um, you certainly have a really interesting data set now that you can go combine with other data sets to try to better understand uh, the socioeconomics uh, of a city or, or health patterns in a city. Um, there's actually a project right now, um, the uh, University of Maryland and NPR saw the, the work that we had done in January, and they're gonna be using this data to try to see if they can find any interesting correlations with this tree data and public health data and socio socioeconomic data. So again, this is a theme that runs throughout the presentation that as we create these data sets, it's really exciting because we can start to see uh, correlations among them that we might have not seen otherwise. Uh, this is New York City. Um, so as you can imagine, um, there's prominent places where there are trees, um, cemeteries, parks, and whatnot. Um, but there's, uh, there's also tree deserts, right? Like places where there are no trees. This can help city planners decide where to put parks. Um, <laughs> this is interesting. Uh, this is Boston. Um, obviously, you see a lot of trees uh, um, uh, sort of in the Boston Common. Um, but you'll see on the far left or right side of the image, the trees in front of the C, uh, CVS in Downtown Crossing. Thank you, CVS, for being good stewards of the environment and planting a bunch of trees. Uh, but you sort of see lots of interesting things pop out here. Well, I must have had a lot of coffee. I did this much faster than I thought I would. <laughs> <laughs> um, so those are four projects. Obviously, I, I hope this gives you a lot of hope, right? Um, there's just a ton of data going online about the planet right now. Um, and as much as, like, there's headlines all the time about how bad it is, right? And it's not good, right? Like, we, we really need to, um, to wisen up in, in order to make sure that the planet is still here 100 years from now. That being said, there's so much we don't know. I mean, think about what I was telling you about methane and all the things we don't know about one of the worst greenhouse gases. Uh, it's critical that we start collecting data and start using that data to build better models so we understand uh, the, the methane cycle, for example. So you know, there's data going online everywhere. It's not just space. Of course, launch costs and cheaper hardware allows us to put more satellites up. Uh, but there's also drones. Um, there is really cool, um, uh, there's this thing from Airbus that's basically this uh, massive lightweight drone covered in solar panels uh, that soon will just be able to circle um, for three months at a time, put any camera you want on it. So much cheaper than going to space. Um, obviously drones and whatnot. Um, and there's a lot on the ground too. So every ship is tracked, every barge, combine, trailer, tractor, refinery, they all have sensors on them. Um, and combining all this data from different levels uh, will give us a much, much, much richer picture uh, of the planet. And that's ultimately what we're trying to do at Descartes Labs, is prepare ourselves for this world. Um, I said we ingest about uh, 10 to 15 peta uh, sorry, terabytes of data a day. Um, there's gonna be a point over, uh, over the next 10 years where we're probably going to be getting a petabyte of data from the sky per day. And we wanna build that infrastructure so that we can go process and see the data at that scale. Um, because as, if we really wanna stem climate change, if we really wanna understand going on the, what's going on on the planet, um, we need to be able to understand this data at, at global scale. Um, and that's what we're trying to build at Descartes Labs, is that we wanna build this system that better understands the planet, both for the companies that are operating on the planet and to make sure that we can do some good for this world. Okay, that was way quicker than I thought. I have plenty of time for questions now. 